So I recently watched a Tom Scott video about copyright and by the way, if you don't already watch his channel, go do that because it's top notch on YouTube. Anyways, the video kind of got me thinking about content ID, royalty free samples and loops, and generally the very weird state that we find ourselves in on YouTube as producers and content creators. First of all, just like Tom, I am not a lawyer or a legal expert, I'm just a guy who likes to make videos about things that I find interesting. In this video, we're going to focus on an emerging problem that has started affecting audio copyright on YouTube in the recent years. And that problem is subscription sample services being mixed together with old copyright law and content ID on YouTube. First, let's establish a brief outline of how copyright works when you're just an individual creating works of your own. If you're a producer or artist and you make a song and that work is recorded as a digital file or written down as sheet music, you technically own the copyright to your work without needing to register or do any paperwork. It's sort of like when you write code on your computer, as soon as whatever you write is in a tangible medium, you own the copyright to that work. The copyright in the US calls this work being fixed in a tangible medium. However, this doesn't mean you should shy away from paperwork, because registering your work with the US Copyright Office affords you access to federal courts in case of infringement, as well as publicly records your ownership of your own art. So if you're planning to sell copies or license samples, don't hesitate to register as it will make your life way easier. There's also another type of copyright that Tom mentions in his video related to music, and that's the rights to each individual performance of a work. We won't be focusing on this here, but if you're interested in learning about it, I'll leave a timestamped link to Tom's video going in depth on the subject. Anyways, the fact that your work is protected from the moment of its inception sounds like really great news for creators everywhere. However, things get a little bit more complicated when the internet evolves as quickly as it does. So let's go over the three different things that when mixed together created one of the weirdest problems with audio copyright that I've ever encountered. I'm sure most of you watching know all too well about the crazy stories that have arisen from the DMCA, but I think it's important to understand why it exists in the first place. Most people know what the DMCA is by now, so we'll just touch on it briefly. The DMCA was created as a way to balance the interest of internet service providers or platforms hosting content, users of the internet, and the copyright holders themselves. At its most basic, it gives copyright holders easy access to website hosts or admins to take infringing content off very quickly. Congress had passed this law as a band-aid or duct tape fix to the copyright system because the internet was evolving so rapidly and copyright holders were getting increasingly antsy about their works being distributed online. This results in the can being kicked down the road for future regulators to deal with, and it's why we find ourselves in this situation. There are certainly a bunch of negative feelings surrounding DMCA, including some of my own, and understandably so, because the system can be unbelievably frustrating to work with. Whether it's YouTubers getting false striked, companies abusing the system for their own gain, or simply just human error on the claimant side. These are very real problems with DMCA specifically on YouTube, and it's ripe with abuse, especially when there's money to be made. There are even companies out there that exist exclusively to falsely copyright claim videos in the hopes that the creator won't fight back so they can claim the revenue. All of this is to say that while the DMCA isn't a great solution, it is literally holding together the internet with some yarn and Elmer's glue. And just as Tom said in his video, the world has moved on, but copyright law hasn't yet. The DMCA isn't really that terrible in and of itself, at least to me, but it's when we pile on two more layers on top of this that this problem gets way more dicey. Layer number two is content ID. Just like the DMCA, I'm sure most people at least have a vague idea of what it is and how it works, so we'll just give a short overview. It dates back all the way to 2007, when YouTube implemented it as a way for copyright holders to submit their works to a database and have YouTube check every single video for any matches. This automates the process so that people don't have to manually go through videos finding infringing content, which sounds great, but in practice and as with most automated systems, there are some issues that arise. 
I think the concept of content ID itself is probably okay, but in practice, the first glaring issue that I see with it is that it just makes mistakes sometimes. It's definitely gotten way better over the years, but there are still times when you make a video that gets flagged and you have to go through the process of appealing it, which sometimes just straight up doesn't work and you lose the revenue for that video. Problem number two, it is not super hard to get signed up to use Content ID on YouTube, and this results in some Twilight Zone shit happening. I've had personal experience with people submitting my own works as their own, and then my video getting flagged by the system, and they start siphoning revenue from it. The third problem that I see with Content ID is that it doesn't really understand fair use or licensing because it's an automated system. This is the larger issue that I see, and it connects perfectly with the third layer that we'll go over in a moment. To be fair to YouTube, I do understand why they do this, because they don't want large copyright holders with a lot of money up their ass about them not doing enough to protect their content. So now we've got two different systems that are sort of like putting duct tape over a burst pipe, and now we move on to the third layer, which might as well be trying to put out a fire by throwing paper on it when you try to wrap your head around this newer problem. Sampling is definitely nothing new here. The music industry is practically built upon it as a concept. Taking a sample and licensing it and then using it in a piece of music that you're making seems to not be too big a problem here on YouTube. You get a license or pay royalties to the owner and all is well on all sides. However, in the last decade, there have been companies popping up that allow people to play a monthly subscription fee to access to literally millions of samples that they can use royalty free. This sounds like an amazing idea, and it's clearly working for them because these services are billion dollar companies now. I personally use Splice, but there are tons out there like Loop Cloud or Sounds by Native Instruments. Here's the meat and potatoes of it. Because everyone who subscribes to these services is allowed to use them royalty free and profit off the work that they create with them, who actually owns these samples? What if two extremely popular artists use the same sample and both of their songs become hits? This shit gets confusing really quickly. I've personally had loops that I've used in my music being flagged by Content ID because another artist had used them and submitted their song to the Content ID database even though both of us had paid for the subscription. The same thing happens with DMCA claims from larger companies or labels who have artists that use these loops in their songs. I actually reached out to Splice about this and read their extremely long licensing agreement and I didn't really get a clear answer. Anyone who uses these samples should theoretically be able to profit from their own works, but in practice, companies who use DMCA claims and content ID with these loops will fight tooth and nail for their revenue for their artist's songs. I've had some success with sending appeals in with proof that I have the rights to these samples, but a good amount of times the company just simply denies the appeal and takes all the revenue. I can imagine that other producers and also content creators and editors who don't even make music but might be using a song that uses one of these loops run into a similar issue. I think this type of thing is going to start slowly affecting more and more people as more people subscribe to these sample services and more editors and more YouTubers discover all of these songs that are created with these loops that they can purchase with licenses. If two big labels are duking it out over these samples from their artist songs, it'll probably be settled out of court and YouTube and they'll come to an agreement. However, if you're just a small YouTuber that wants to use these samples that you have the rights to, you might find yourself getting all the revenue taken away from your video that you worked hard to create. So what do we actually do about this problem? Well, I am most certainly not qualified to come up with a solution. All I know is that creators small and large are being affected by this, and it'll probably only get bigger as time goes on unless something changes. Thank you for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.